Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Ben Rosewell on open source democracy promotion. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week we speak to a noted expert in some area of global governance. Here from the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. And this week I'm pleased to welcome Ben Rosewell, visiting scholar at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. Welcome, Ben. Thank you very much. And we should say for our audience, also um, a career foreign service officer with the Government of Canada, currently on leave, uh, speaking to us today in uh, your personal capacity as a visiting scholar and not as a representative of the Canadian government. That's right. Now, Ben, your special interest is a democracy promotion, and you have a particular interest in the role of technology. And as we've all been following with, uh, with great interest and some large degree of surprise, the events in the so-called Arab Spring, um, the role of technology seems obviously to have featured very, very mm -hmm. prominently, at least in some countries that have been experiencing upheaval, and uh, particularly in Egypt. And I understand you've focused uh, quite heavily recently on the role of social media in the Egyptian uh, uh, revolution. Yeah, that's right. Well, my interest for some time, including with the Canadian government, has been on issues of democracy promotion um, in, uh, in the Arab and Muslim world more generally um, because of the, uh, the challenges uh, to international security that have arisen from problems of domestic governance. My interest in technology is, is new, and that's because of the, the very um, dramatic changes that it's demonstrated it can bring into political systems that have been ossified for, uh, for many years. So to find out a bit more, I traveled to Egypt, um, a country where I had been posted as a diplomat, and so I have some sense of the political situation, but I wanted to find out about how democracy activists were able to finally make a change after 30 years of the Mubarak regime, in particular to using technology. Now we've all heard about the importance of these technologies in, in the uh, events in Egypt. But how actually would they work on the ground? Exactly how would people on the street use these tools in order to coordinate activities or share knowledge or spread ideas? How would the government use them or attempt to curtail them in order to prevent certain things from happening? Well, uh, I, think th I think the reason that technology had such a dramatic impact is because it was not expected to, ha to, to be used for political purposes. So. Facebook membership, for example, grew steadily throughout the entire last decade. The government actually encouraged um, as much um, access to bandwidth as possible because they thought it would be good for economic activity, as it is. I mean, we're in a digital economy, so uh, there were social and economic reasons for there to be a diffusion of technology. And like everyone else, Egyptians use Facebook primarily for social purposes, to share pictures of the family or funny cat videos or uh, to go arrange dates or what have you. But when you get to a certain size of the population, a certain amount of the population that are, um, that are communicating in these ways in a country where other forms of communication are severely restricted, that's when you start to see some political possibilities. So for the last 30 years, Egypt has operated under a emergency law that banned gatherings of more than five people in public places. Uh, that's quite restrictive. On Facebook, there's no limits on how many people can gather. So you would get Facebook sites that would have hundreds of thousands of people gathering. And when they start talking about politics in those numbers, then you get dramatically different political outcomes. But Facebook doesn't have any real-time two-way communication capabilities except through the limited chat window function, right, which is one-to-one. -one. So presumably that isn't going to be very helpful for mobilization or coordination. So in effect, you'd have to post something on Facebook, and you'd have to wait for enough people to look at that post, actively look at it. Um, there'd be some delay between a posting and whatever outcome. So I would think that Facebook would be a rather clunky mechanism for coordinating um, swift well, collective action in an evolving, rapidly evolving situation. Actually, uh, Facebook turned out to be uh, extraordinarily effective as a, as a uh, tool. The most famous Facebook page, of course, was We Are All Khaled Saeed, named after the 27-year-old blogger who was beaten to death by the police for uploading videos of, uh, of alleged police involvement in a drug deal. Um, a Facebook page was established immediately after photos of his bloodied corpse went viral in, uh, in, in Egypt. The Facebook page uh, evoked a sense of solidarity with this person that many, many Egyptians would identify, a regular middle-class guy just hanging out at a cyber cafe and next thing you know he's dead. Um, that website quickly grew 
or that uh, Facebook page quickly grew to about 400,000 members. Um, and what seemed to be really effective about Facebook was two things. The first, of, first is the, the, um, the high degree of interactivity, so that uh, when information was posted by the administrators of the Facebook page, every single member gets to comment. And you would see in the We Are All Khalid Facebook page, there would be thousands and thousands of comments, way more than anyone could ever read. But there, there's that kind of sense of interactivity that made people feel like they belonged to something. Mm -hmm. they, it was their site. It wasn't just news that they were reading. It engages them. And then there's also high emotional content in Facebook because it allows you to play uh, videos and photos. And because you're a member of that group, it's not a, it, there isn't that separation of you're watching a TV channel that belongs to someone else. This is a group that you belong to and that you kind of co-create the content. And so it managed to break down a lot of the barriers to political activity that existed beforehand. Now you can set Facebook up so that it will push comments to your email or alert you to a new comment and so on. Uh, otherwise, you have to go and look, right? So uh, how effective is it uh, as a coordinating tool as opposed to a, a way of keeping passions high, mm. sort of just keeping people engaged and raged on the streets rather than, you know, we need people to go here at this time because we expect the army to show up there or, you know, don't come here right. in an hour and a half because we hear there's going to be a crackdown there, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, the, the main finding that I had from my time in Egypt, there's no one particular tool that was kind of a killer app for politics. Um, rather, different tools uh, introduced different um, dynamics to the political environment. So I mentioned already how Facebook uh, created a new space for political discussion that didn't exist before. So you could have hundreds of thousands of people exchanging opinions, which mm -hmm. you could not have in the pre-Facebook era. Um, the second thing is that it uh, lowered the cost of participation in politics, so it brought people into the political realm that weren't there already. It kind of um, uh, encouraged people uh, to get involved and to become activists that, the, that they weren't there before. Um, technology also allowed uh, political movements to deploy new tactics. Um, so, in fact, here YouTube was probably the more, more uh, common technology where Posting videos, for example, of police actions during the 18 days in Tahrir Square allowed the protesters to go uh, above the head of the regime and their propaganda tools and the state-controlled media and get their story directly to the population so that they could shape the narrative as the vast majority of, uh, of Egyptians saw what was going on. So none of these tools in, them, in and of themselves were the, like, took the form of a political institution. Um, the activists uh, themselves had a political had political strategies, and they used these just as tools um, to to broaden their impact in uh, bringing people in and motivating them to get out to the street. It's still a fundamentally political activity that they're engaging in with these new tools. And do you have a sense of how much of the value of these tools was making sure that the internal story got out internationally, and how much was making sure people in Egypt? continued to be focused, inflamed? Um. Well, one of the interesting things, of course, is with, um, with uh, social media technology, it blurs the divisions between the domestic and the international. Um, so you would have um, people outside of Egypt that were uh, relaying information back into Egypt. Mm. And it, um, it, it meant that uh, you could mobilize a, a much wider set of people. So there are a lot of Egyptians living outside of Egypt, of which there are, you know, millions or tens of millions who were active participants in what was happening in Tahrir Square uh, thanks, to the, uh, thanks to the technology. All right. Well, we'll be back in a moment with Ben Roswell to talk more about open source democracy promotion. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, ben, let's talk about the other side of the street here, the, the regime side. Now, the Mubarak regime did attempt to move fairly quickly to shut down That's a right. lot of the social media. And uh, in fact, some analysts were very surprised at how effectively they had managed to mm -hmm. cut off communications between Egypt and the outside world. Yeah. Uh, how did they do that first? And uh, secondly, were their efforts successful? It didn't seem from the outside as though those efforts had much of an impact. Yeah. Uh, apparently, the technological sophistication of the regime's effort to shut down the internet was uh, really quite remarkable. Um, the connections between the uh, the internet um, inside Egypt and the outside world uh, were 
limited in numbers so that the uh, the regime would was able to uh, to exercise influence over internet service providers for example mm -hmm. um, to ban them from uh, to force them to shut down their mach their machines and they'd mapped out apparently quite extensively what those networks were and then same thing for the phone network they were not successful however and that's because it wasn't the tools themselves that were driving the revolution it was the the political activity of the activists and I think the most significant finding um, of the role of technology in the Egyptian revolution wasn't about any one particular tool. It's about a mindset that um, a movement adapts, adopts because of the technology it's using. I call this uh, the social media mindset. And I think it helps us understand the character of the Egyptian democracy movement. It helps us understand how even when the tools are cut off, it continues to operate. So one factor is that it's a network. It's not. Um, um, a traditional organization with a leadership. Everyone talked about how this was kind of a, a leaderless movement, and that's because in a social media context, there's no leader. Mm -hmm. um, people participate as equals, as peers. Um, they, and is that empowering? Would people experience a personal sense of empowerment as a result of that, or it would is, it yeah, there's be a sense, confusing? For one thing, there's a sense of equality that everyone who's a member of a Facebook page is a member, you know, in an equal capacity. You can't be like a, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, I'm not more of a member of that one Facebook page than you are. We're both, we're both equal and we both have the same ability to post content. Um, there's also a sense of collective ownership. And what we saw with the dynamic in Tahrir Square is that people felt like this was their movement. Mm -hmm. um, and you still see that now. You talk to Egyptians, they say, this was our revolution, it won't be taken away from us. That, I think, also comes with that social media mindset. And then the third dynamic that's striking about this is a real desire to document, to be completely transparent and on the record for everything. That's something that's quite natural to the sort of digital natives in their teens now, and maybe the early 20s. A little bit less natural for people like me in their 40s. Don't know how old you are, but anyway, we tend to have a higher sense of privacy that, you know, our, the details of our lives are not meant to be on the mm -hmm. internet. Um, younger people don't have that kind of hesitation, and what we saw with the Egyptian democracy movement, they don't have that hesitation. They want everything to be out in the public space. Um, so when the, the, when the regime shut down the internet, some of those habits of operating as a network, uh, of being completely open with sharing information, and a strong sense of collective ownership um, allowed, them, allowed the Egyptian democracy movement to, to continue, and actually even to, to thrive. And we saw the protests, the size of the crowds in Tahrir Square actually increase through the time that, uh, that the, the uh, internet was cut off. So there wouldn't be any sense of frustration or disempowerment when people went and looked, or attempted to look at their, their Facebook page and got an error message or you know, inability to well, load think error, a page or something like that. From the activists that we talked to, I think uh, it helped reveal to a wider set of Egyptians the true nature of the regime. Mm -hmm. This was a regime that was fundamentally about restricting the, um, the rights of, of, uh, of citizens, that uh, it had its own interests to protect, and those interests weren't necessarily those of the public. So it may be that shutting down the internet um, uh, showed a degree of desperation and revealed the true colors of the regime to, uh, to a wider set of Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Now another technology that was prominently discussed was Twitter. Mm -hmm. and in fact, I was following events in Tahrir Square primarily through Twitter. Uh, how effective was that compared to Facebook? Very different mode of interaction, sort of mass SMS in effect. Yeah, uh, we heard mostly about Facebook and YouTube um, when we were in our, conducting our interviews with Egyptian uh, democracy activists. Um, Twitter was useful, I guess, particularly when uh, the internet was shut down because of the speak to tweet service that Google was able to set up where um, people in Tahrir Square could use the phones when they still had the access to the phones mm -hmm. uh, to send messages that would then be relayed into, into tweets and then sent to the outside world. That was the, the specific role that Twitter seems to, uh, seems to have played. Um, Twitter also has uh, greater security features than Facebook, so uh, there's some um, greater assurances that uh, there'll be less hacking by uh, security uh, apparatuses into, into people's uh, Twitter accounts. Now in Iran a couple of years ago, um, around the time of the, the rigged election, uh, outsiders were actually using social media to sort of provide crucial information to insiders, uh, for example, by ensuring that the BBC was available despite the fact that the government was trying to set up filters to keep BBC news coverage out of the country. Mm -hmm. Was that also happening in Egypt or was it a different dynamic that really the social media 
the connectivity was being driven by people inside the country and outsiders were not stage managing or, or dr directly trying to influence um, events on the street. Was it different international no, I think there dynamic? Was, or? I, th I think there's very much a, a, a strong international component um, with the diaspora of Egyptians around the world uh, participating. Um, that's it. Be, their role becomes more necessary in in highly repressive systems. So as the as the uh, Egyptian security institutions started to retreat from the space, um, it may not have been as necessary as it was in Iran, where the Iranian security institutions were quite assertive in uh, in trying to keep a, a lid on things in the in the Green Revolution in uh, in uh, in 2009. But I think that's one of the dynamics that's. Um, promising about technology is that the, it's this, these political movements that use social media are inherently open to um, the world. They're sharing information with the world um, and others are welcome to participate in them as long as they're participating in the same basis of uh, peers in a network mm -hmm. as opposed to um, in any kind of hierarchical or leadership position. And that's where I think there gets to be some really interesting opportunities for outsiders that want to contribute to democratization processes in countries like Egypt. Normatively, the inverse of the kinds of regimes they're trying to do battle with. We'll be back in a moment with Ben Roswell to talk more about open source democracy promotion. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, ben, let's now talk about what outsiders can do proactively. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're interested in promoting democracy, presumably we want to make the best possible use ourselves of available tools uh, to assist people uh, who want to achieve democracy in their own countries. So based on what we've experienced recently, uh, what should we do differently? What, what worked well? What didn't work well? What kinds of tools do we need now? Mm -hmm. How do we get them and get them in the right hands and deploy them effectively? Well, there have been a, f a number of really serious limitations to uh, our efforts to do democracy promotion in, um, in countries uh, in the Arab world or Muslim world or really uh, in, in other countries more generally. When you have democracy promotion that's based on uh, the assumption that there are institutions that work in established democracies and those institutions just need to be replicated in other contexts. Um, you see a tremendous amount of resistance and also um, assumptions that just aren't borne out. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the criticism of democracy promotion over the last 10 years or so is that we can't export democracy. And that's true. We can't take you know, the Canadian parliament and just reproduce it in Cairo and hope that that's going to, that, that's going to work. Um, the promise of, uh, of technology is that uh, it allows us uh, to focus on just sharing tools and not institutions. Tools so that Egyptians, in this case, can build their own institutions. Democracy need to respond to whatever the local, uh, local political uh, realities are. Um, and ultimately, only Egyptians can build institutions uh, that will work for, for them, that will protect the rights and that will balance the various interests at play in Egyptian society. So, what we should be focusing is on not uh, transplanting institutions, but by equipping uh, Egyptian activists with tools to do that. Now, those tools could be either technological or they could be the tools, um, the skill sets that are necessary in order to organize political parties or to found NGOs or to advocate for human rights or those sorts of things. Uh, rather than identifying what the outcome should be, we should be thinking more about just helping Egyptians with the process. And promoting transparency, I suppose, is step one. Yeah, I think also um, we should be completely transparent with whatever we're doing so that Egyptians can judge for, for themselves if they welcome the role that's coming from the international. This, is, this needs to be completely demand-driven. Um, if there's no interest for democracy in Egypt, then we should not be promoting democracy. As it turns out, there's, we saw in the last few months, there's a tremendous interest in democracy, but there's also a sense that they have, you know, we Egyptians have to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't come and tell us what kind of democracy we need in here. Um, but if you've got tangible things that you can do that will help us confront some of the problems that we have, growing uh, concerns about polarization between Christians and Muslims, or debates over the role of the uh, religion in Islam, which tend to be real touch tones of, uh, of, of Egyptian politics. If you've got specific tools that help. Uh, 
Role of Women is one that, uh, that, that uh, gets quite a lot of uh, attention outside of Egypt. Um, I didn't come across many debates within within Egypt oh, that's on, interesting. That, on, the, on that particular issue. Women played a very prominent role in, the, uh, in Tahrir Square, right. by the way. They're very right, right. prominent in the democracy activists, uh, in the community of democracy activists. And by some accounts, feeling a bit left out of the aftermath. Um, if Egypt takes a turn for the more, um, uh, for, to a, a greater degree of religion in, uh, in, the, in the laws of the country, then there certainly could mm -hmm. be some, uh, some concerns. Now, the internet is not a perfectly globalized thing. Uh, there are still national boundaries, as we saw, because the Egyptian government was able to shut down a significant portion of the flow in and out of the country. Uh, so I guess in the ideal world, there would be no national capability to filter or, uh, or a block or monitor so that you could have as full a flow of information as possible in and out of uh, national boundaries. We're not there. But should we be attempting to promote that as outsiders? Or is that in some sense a sort of invidious violation of principles of sovereignty? Uh, well, I think, the, uh, I think the norms that already apply in international human rights law uh, provide some guidance here, that there's norms about freedom of expression, about freedom of the press, um, which would apply whether you're talking about traditional media or, or new media. And those, I, I th those I think, should guide our uh, whatever policies we have about, uh, about the access that citizens have to the Internet. But uh, let me make a distinction here about the role of governments and the role of private actors or of um, society to society linkages, because I think that's the other area of promise with uh, what we've been seeing with technology and social media in, in Egypt. One of the other limitations on democracy promotion was the sense that uh, they were being, this agenda was being advanced by governments such as ours or the US government or European governments um, that have other agendas as well. We are interested in democracy and human rights in these countries, but we also have security concerns, we have commercial concerns, other things that are all valid for governments like ours to, uh, to have. Um, democracy promotion is ultimately not just about what states uh, do, but it's also about the relationship between states and society. So technology allows um, other actors, other than our national governments, uh, to be involved in the effort to bring democracy. And that helps us get away from some of the legitimacy questions about you know, whose business is it, is it for Washington, D.C. to decide what should be happening on the streets of, uh, of Cairo. But there are many U.S. Um, citizens, NGOs, researchers, tech firms um, that have uh, tangible benefits that could be that could be brought to uh, to help the Egyptian democracy movement. And same thing for Canada. Canadian researchers, NGOs, activists, our tech firms could also play a very positive role in helping um, Egyptians with some of the tools that they need to build democracy in their own country. Mm -hmm. In fact, Canada is at the uh, center of one of the most effective international networks to promote open dialogue globally, the uh, Open Net Initiative. And the, yeah, uh, that's right. The uh, Monk School of Global Affairs uh, Citizen Lab. The Citizen Lab, that's right. We'll be back in a moment with Ben Rosewell to talk about open source uh, democracy promotion. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, ben, let's step back from Egypt just for a minute. And uh, we've had a, quite a lot of experience in recent years with uh, domestic upheaval mm -hmm. and uh, increasing amount of experience with the role of social media and, and how they play out in, in these upheavals. We've already spoken a bit about the Green Revolution in Iran, um, events in Burma or Myanmar a few years ago uh, had uh, particularly uh, close scrutiny because there was this penetration through social media and other, other things. Right. Uh, with Tunisia, uh, now Syria as we speak, uh, the Syrian drama is unfolding. It, it seems to be a mixed story as to uh, whether um, social media and connectivity are empowering the people versus the government or, or whether there's sort of an uh, right. offsetting advantage that governments play by virtue of their capacity, for example, to shut down the yeah. information infrastructure to some extent. So, Hard to say from the overall record that there's a clear pattern. That this is always promoting democracy. Yeah. Um, what's your thought on that? Well, I think the real story isn't so much whether what r role social media or other technology is having on uh, democracy in these countries. 
because the, the real story is what is the relationship between state and society in each of these nations. And every country has its own dynamic of uh, relationship between those who hold power and those over whom it is held. Um, so as different tools are introduced, that will tip the balance in one way or the other. We certainly have seen um, repressive regimes use uh, social media and other technologies in order to make their repression more effective. Um, I wouldn't actually limit this just to uh, countries that are going through these kinds of upheavals. I think that um, the, one of the exciting things about technology is that it, it uh, helps redefine state society relationships in any countries, including in our own. Um, the reason that I uh, have been calling this open source democracy promotion is that I think it could be completely reciprocal, that we may be seeing uh, innovations in Egypt, for example, in the way that citizens organize themselves together and how the state, how they interact with the state, that could actually be replicated elsewhere. Now, they may be replicated in other Arab countries in the Arab Spring, um, but there's no reason why those wouldn't necessarily be replicated back in our own societies. One, one project that we're working with, uh, with Egyptians is to crowdsource constitutional negotiations. So rather than just have a small group of 100 or 150 legal experts hole up in a room for nine months or 12 months and come up with a constitutional text, why not open that process to thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of citizens using wiki type of technologies? Um, there's no reason if we were able to build that tool for Egypt why countries, even in established democracies, would not be able to would not be able to use that tool. So it allows us, um, by focusing more on the tools and rather than the outcomes or the institutions that are being built, it allows uh, this expertise to be shared in a much more reciprocal way so that, for example, we now be in a, may now be in a position where Egyptians will be teaching us more about democracy than we have to teach them. Wiki constitution writing is an intriguing concept. Has anybody experimented with this? Yeah, there has been some experiments. And does it work? Do people find their way to a to a happy medium? Or do they build in contradictions? Or do they just yeah. constantly go back and forth revising their entries and you know, get this stalemate? Relatively new. So there's one example in Iceland that we know of. There's one with the European Union. And then there's been a, a constitution for the government in exile of Burma that have all been using very, various types of crowdsourcing constitution. Um, some early uh, conclusions of this is that uh, you're not likely to get a very neat text in the way that you might with Wikipedia, because these are not technical issues that are being discussed. Mm -hmm. These are fundamentally different values that need right. to be that need to be balanced. Um, so you, you're not necessarily going to get the neat text, but what you will uh, see is a, a engaging a much broader section of the population in the discussion. And sometimes you can see possibilities emerge that wouldn't have been obvious in the political debate. So for example, in Canada, our constitutional debates are always over you know, the status of Quebec in Canada, and that tends to be very polarizing between separatists and, and federalists, and then each poll kind of informs its own views. The um, promise of crowdsourcing is that you can, you can engage a much broader and more diverse set of opinions, and people start to see how different constituencies might be able to interact with each other on different sets of issues, and it sort of opens up the political uh, possibilities that are available, and in the process in, uh, educates the participants, the voters, or, ha or what have you, um, in, uh, in, the in some of the issues that are involved in the Constitution to depolarize and to make the, the debate more sophisticated. Is there a role here for global governance, or is sort of global governance of this sort of inherently antithetical to the idea of open source democracy promotion? Well, I don't see an obvious role for international uh, organizations which are based on state-to-state -state linkages. Uh, because they only represent one side of the equation. What we're interested in here is state-society linkages. Uh, but there's no reason why there wouldn't be some kind of global uh, governance role to be played in building uh, connections between uh, society. So, for example, there's organizations like the World Movement for Democracy, um, which is uh, an international collective of democracy activists in many countries where they share um, best practices or tactics or techniques with one another. I think there's a, there's a whole realm there for international cooperation um, Certainly that's possible. Certainly level of standards, that sort of thing. Yeah, and also it's society to society linkages mm -hmm. and not, not exclusively focused on those state to state right. linkages. Well, this has been fascinating, and I've learned a great deal, and I hope our audience has as well. As well. Thank you, Ben, for coming and spending time with us today. Thank you very much. And, uh, it's a pleasure our, to be here. For our audience, uh, we will look for you again next week. Uh, you can find our complete collection of episodes at cgonline.org. 
and Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube.